Welcome to those of you who are joining us for our inaugural DC in the Movies webinar series. Tonight we're going to feature Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, made in 1939 by filmmaker Frank Capra and starring Jimmy Stewart. I am Carolyn Crouch and I'm the founder of Washington Walks a DC-based walking tour company that's been in existence for about two decades now. But that is a short duration for um, something to exist in Washington compared to my colleague and our guest tonight, Mike Canning, who has lived on the Capitol Hill neighborhood for how many years, Mike? 50. In the same house. In the same house. Wow. Wow. Ever think about, did you ever consider moving? Never. That's your place. <laughs> we're we're going to croak here. <laughs> um, I'm curious. I've been thinking about just, I think because um, Mayor Bowser today put out an announcement saying, well, we're going to still stay in place until May 15. And that got me thinking about, well, when we eventually don't have to stay in place and businesses start to open again, where's the first place, the first food destination besides a grocery store that I hope to go? And my place, I think, is going to be Teaism Pen Quarter, which is a go-to place for our family. Do you and your wife have a place like that on Capitol Hill? Oof, we have a bunch of options on Capitol Hill. I'm not sure that we, we would select one. I mean, we go to about um, maybe seven to 10 regularly, and there's only about uh, 40 different places to eat on Capitol Hill that we can walk to. So we got a lot of options. Yeah, it's wonderful. Mike, just start talking a little bit about how, um, I think people who are tuning into this webinar, if they've read our promotion, about it, know that you review films for the Hill Rag newspaper, which is a monthly that comes out in the greater Capitol Hill neighborhood. You can also pick it up in my neighborhood of Southwest DC. You're the author of a book, Hollywood on the Potomac. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a screen up that lets people know how they can pick up your book if they want to get a copy. But how did you get into reviewing movies? A very good question and a very odd answer. Serendipity. Uh, my, my working life uh, for 30 some years was in the uh, US Foreign Service. Uh, so two thirds of my 30 years was spent overseas in uh, eight different countries on four continents. Uh, quite a variety, but mainly in Latin America. Uh, I retired in 1993, so more than 25 years ago. And I was uh, literally wondering what I was going to do next in my life. And I was attending a seminar about uh, work after the Foreign Service. And I knew I wanted to do something different. And a miracle of miracles, uh, in a, a, the Hill Rag itself, the newspaper I eventually joined, they had an ad for a film, film critic. Amazing. This was, the timing was just spectacular. And I thought, well, I've worked on, with movies all my life because I was in a cultural and information or press job uh, in various embassies around the world. And I was a big film fan at the time, always had been since I first saw Bambi at four years old. Mm. And here was a chance for me to maybe actually do something about movies, get, get more involved. And I'd written a lot about them anyway, I'd written a lot of essays and other uh, program notes and so on for decades. So it was in my blood already. Um, and the paper hired me. With a, I provided a little essay from a current movie. And they hired me, amazingly film? enough. You remember what the essay was from what film? Sure. They, I had to review a movie that was out at that time. It was right. 1993, about October. No, a little earlier, but like August. And I reviewed uh, the just released um, uh, Kenneth Branagh. Um, oh, Henry V? No, 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 sorry. The comedy, I'm blanking. Much Ado About Nothing. Ah. Uh, the, the set in, in uh, fakey, Italy. Um, fakey Italy right. with uh, Kenneth Ron and his wife at the time, Emma Thompson. 
So I wrote about 600 words, sent it in. Uh, they, they said, this is fine, uh, we'll take you on. At the time, the rag, Hill Rag was uh, bi-weekly, so the deadlines were tougher, uh, but I didn't mind. And I would, I would write one to three reviews each uh, week or uh, bi-weekly. Anyway, that got That's me in the game. Uh, and, okay, sorry. And well, and so how I'm sort of connected to you or was connected to you was I went to one of a talk that you gave um, on Capitol Hill at the um, Masonic Hall. Right. And it was on how Hollywood could have gotten it right when they're depicting Washington in their movies, but so often they didn't. Correct. And that was sort of an irritation. It was a really excellent lecture. Thank About you. that same time, at Washington Walks, we were launching or about to launch, we don't typically do bus tours, but we really wanted to do one about movies set in Washington, D.C., and then go see where these films had been, what they had, how they used D.C., and we called it Real Washington, R-E-E-L. Right. Um, we did it for about two years, but kind of realized, you know, we're really meant to be walking tour guides and be a walking tour company. But this notion of your book, Hollywood on the Potomac, has stuck with me and stuck with us. And so happy that you were willing and are willing to do this series of webinars with us. My pleasure. So let's, um, I'm gonna put up the first visual, which is the, movie poster for the film we're talking about tonight. And who are we seeing in this movie poster? We've got, uh, their credits are given at the bottom there, you can see. Uh, the name above the title, uh, Frank Capra, uh, he's the director, uh, which is, by the way, his, the name of his biography, which I consulted in writing about this. Uh, he's the name above the title, as directors were in those days. This is 1939. And there's Jimmy uh, cuddling uh, with Gene Arthur, his co-star. She gets first billing notice. Uh, the lead uh, featured player is Claude Rains up there playing a senator, once uh, uh, benign and now uh, 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 venal. Yes. And below the great character actors from Columbia Pictures in this case, uh, Edward Arnold, who's a swine, a boss, uh, who controls politics in his state, never named. Uh, Guy Kibbe, who plays the governor of the state, totally under the thumb of Arnold. Uh, Thomas Mitchell, who is playing a uh, smart but drunk uh, local um, Capitol Hill correspondent. And finally, uh, Bela Bondi, who plays the uh, benign, lovely mama of uh, Jimmy Stewart's character, Jefferson Smith. Jefferson Smith has lost his father to a, uh, he was murdered. He's a, a dutiful and uh, honest newspaper man who's killed for his for his politics uh, earlier, you don't see him at all. But Beulah Bondi has uh, brought him up right and he heads a, him, him Stewart and Jefferson Smith, heads a group of a, like a Boy Scouts right. group called the Boy Rangers. And uh, he's in his 20s and uh, new to everything and he's never been out of the state. And he's, be, and he's a super fan of American history and politics, which he knows back and, backwards and forwards. Was also Frank Capra, is that one reason that he comes to make this particular film? What? Because? Because he was so enamored or inspired oh. by the whole American project. Because that's oh, sure. really yes. throughout this. Yeah, you know, he's a, we can talk as much as you like about him, but he's, he's in a way almost the perfect immigrant. A kid born uh, in Sicily in uh, 1897, who, uh, in a town outside Palermo who came to the States when he was five and ended up in uh, California with his family. Um, had some education, but dropped it. Uh, got small jobs on a film set. He was in California after all, and got hooked. But he also got hooked on America. Everything that happened to him was kind of a miracle, he thought. And he never lost his uh, both naivete and awareness of the new country he, he'd been adopted by. So he, as you say, he's an immigrant who had his every life dream fulfilled, pretty much. 
Wow. Did it take him a long time to get this film made? Did he face any obstacles? And actually, did he have a difficult time obtaining the source material, which was a novel, right? Correct. A guy named Leslie uh, Foster. No, he did not. He was on a he was on a roll, like very few directors in American movie history. In this in the period between 1933, when he was just in his mid 30s, till 1939, this film, that's it's seven years technically. He was nominated for best director every year but 1935. Wow. And of his films, of those six films, three won Academy Awards as the best picture. Mr. Smith did not. But others, he was, he was a star. He was yeah. relatively young, not even 40. He was no, 40 no. by the time he made this picture, but he'd already won three Academy Awards. He was named the director, head of the Director's Guild at a very young age by his cohorts. Um, he, he was on a tremendous role. He was the only, the star for Columbia Pictures, by the way, at that studio. They didn't have stars like Clark Gable uh, at, and uh, Greta Garbo at MGM. Their star was Frank Capra. And people went to see, and they had much less to spend, so the movies were, were much more um, crisply funded. But people went to see a Capra film because they thought it would be good and they'd enjoy it. It would be a good mix of drama and comedy. And so he had great renown. He had no problem getting any project he wanted. And he had read of the, the um, Foster book, um, the novel, and was interested in it. Uh, he also wanted to uh, star Gary Cooper in it because he'd had a good rapport with Cooper in Mr. Deeds Goes to Town uh, just three years earlier. Uh, but that, that connection didn't work out. Cooper had something else going. Um, and he, he was going to call it uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Washington. That was going to be the title because the character would be um, rerun. And, uh, and by the way, he would also have uh, Gene Arthur as his uh, star, star, female star. So he was going to hire her anyway. Anyway, he ended up with Stuart, who was borrowed from another studio, and uh, it turned out to be terrific uh, casting. Um, but no, he had no problem uh, funding it. it. Of course, he didn't have the money of the big studios like Warner and, and MGM and RKO, but he, he got it made, and he got the budget he wanted. In fact, it was one of the most expensive films Columbia had ever done. It cost them $1.5 million, which was a lot of money in those days for that studio. And I think I know one reason maybe where there was some added expense. You and I were talking earlier um, about a really unique attribute of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And that is how the Valentine that it is to Washington DC. But um, I was really surprised when you told me that um, like Jimmy Stewart never came to Washington, D.C. to be filmed. That's correct. All of his, there, there's a famous sequence, which I hope you'll be able to show, uh, uh, of a montage sequence, brilliantly done by a special effects man in, at Columbia, of Mr. Smith besotted with Washington and Washington history gets actually escapes his miners and gets on a bus at Union Station and starts driving around to all the great um, uh, scenes. In fact, it's a perfect opener here for your series because it's, it's a Washington walk. It except, kind of is. Except yeah. he's, he's walking a lot, but he's on the bus and he, and he, hits, he hits them all. Uh, he's it, gone that, for five hours, according yeah. Dude, to the, the script. Longer than our walks tend to be. That's more of a pilgrimage. Okay. Well, in any case, he, they have, and it's an extremely super, almost grotesquely patriotic yes. sequence with flapping flags and uh, yes. anthems and, uh, all, and wonderful payons to um, American freedom and, and uh, the glories of Washington, etc., and our system. Uh, and he's wide-eyed and uh, just wiped out everywhere he goes. Right. Let's see, I, let's see. I think I can show this. Sure. I, I practiced beforehand. Um, what folks are seeing right now in this still is 
he's arrived at Union Station and that porter is holding some pigeons that he brought with him from his home state out west. And these are his minders that he's going to, he's managed to escape and we're about to see him start his tour. So let me see if I can get this to work. that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolved, resolved that these dead do not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So, sorry the, of those, those of you who could not see that, I apologize. That is just um, rookie technology working on my part, but not on your back up to... Um, he, we can, we'll just recap, he goes and sees, he's on the equivalent of what used to be the tour mobile, I think. And he goes by the Capitol, obviously, the White House, the Washington Monument. He goes over to Arlington and sees the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. He actually does, the order that he does this tour isn't really the order that you would do it. But one thing I really like is it includes um, the Grant Memorial. He's in the Statuary Hall at the US Capitol and then he that where you heard a little boy's voice uh, reading the um, inscriptions inside the Lincoln Memorial. That's where he ends up. But Mike, 
you're here to tell us Jimmy Stewart never was at those places. You yes, uh, let me, uh, by the way, I, I hate to say that I didn't see the, um, the uh, video either. I just heard the audio. Okay, well, sorry about but that. I, I apologize. Okay. I, I saw that, I saw the, the chat uh, indicate from people that they did not. Yeah, I apologize. It, didn't see it. That was my category, but you saw it okay, right? Mm -hmm. I did, yeah. <laughs> but of course it's not my in any case, yes, you're, you're right. The, the, the clip is a, uh, and this was, Capra went, uh, spent a lot of money on this, actually, into pre preparing this uh, DC montage uh, with all the great monuments being shown. And Mr. Smith seeing them for the first time, that's the key thing. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's a good special effects job because the, the second unit, in other words, not the principal filmic unit, but a second unit that goes off oftentimes without stars, and a second director, a second unit director, not the, not the main guy. But to save time and money, they go out and shoot locations, which they incorporate in uh, the film and where it belongs. In this case, uh, the special effects guy and another director came to Washington in 1939, in the summer, I think, and shot all these monuments, in, mainly in vehicles. You can see they're go, driving by them, for right. those who did see it. Uh, and Smith keeps showing up. But he's, he's showing up in ways that, uh, that, that either he could be pasted against uh, a projection screen, just he, he shot anew against a projection screen that's shooting from the back, and he can place himself in any spot, and they have to, they have to work him in. They don't do it digitally, of course. This is much harder. He has to be uh, shot and then recut in a, in, a, in a strip of film and pasted. But more often than not, uh, when you see him, you just see the monument without him. He's not shown in a car ever. And uh, one or two times, the, the effect is the best. One is when he's coming up the steps of the Washington Monument. You can see, now, the the memorial. Memorial, you can see the Washington Monument behind him. Yeah, that's, that's one of the most effective. Uh, it, yeah. No, he he never went into the memorial. There's a there's several shots of him at distance. For example, walking up the Lincoln Memorial from his back. That's a double. Right. When they so show. Him tiny coming in with a monstrous Lincoln statue. Yeah. That's a double. That's not him. And when you see him up close reading in the, or standing next to the Lincoln's words to uh, Gettysburg Address, he's, uh, you see his face up close and he, they cut between the address itself on the wall, easy, and that's intercut with a figure, uh, other people standing with him or he himself in a dusty, kind of cloudy back, backdrop, which is, and it's very gray and unclear, and it doesn't have much uh, definition. That's Jimmy, not on a green screen, but being shot on a separate piece of um, film, which is later literally pasted in to the backdrop. Uh, okay. So he really doesn't, uh, he really didn't have to be there. For the time, that was pretty good. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, it holds up well. It does. You and mentioned how much money uh, Capra or the Columbia spent on this film. So I think one reason they spent money probably is revealed in this image, right? Yes. That, okay. this so was, this is the Washington. We know a lot of people who are listening to us and watching this are Washingtonians. Some of them are tour guides who probably give tours of the U.S. Capitol building. So they yes. see this and they immediately recognize this as if this is the Senate chamber. Yes. Except it isn't not. the Senate chamber. It's a set uh, on the Columbia Pictures lot. Uh, Capra, who's, by the way, standing down there with his script and his other notes, he's in the corner there, um, in the southwest corner. Capra really wanted and thought he could get access to the uh, Senate chamber and shoot there and have a time when he could shoot by himself. Uh, he was not granted permission for that. Um, and nobody in the history of commercial movies has ever shot footage on the Senator House floor, ever, to this day. It's not allowed. It's, in the, it's against the rules. Uh, so you got to do something else. And, and many of them use cheapy effects and stuff. This is no cheapy effect. This is a two scale replica of the Senate, which Capra said he would, and he got built in 1939 in, in, in Hollywood. 
and he spent when he was when he was, uh, he did come to Washington by the way not, not not to work with the second unit maybe he did in any case he spent quite a bit of time in Washington without Jimmy Stewart before the shooting uh, to just get this set to scale and to take hundreds maybe thousands of photographs and to examine and take uh, notes and uh, graph materials and uh, blueprints whatever he could find including stuff in the archives of the Capitol which he used or copied and they brought it all back all this paper and created this set to the uh, as one guy and one, one newspaper columnist said when he saw the film he said they, they built it similar to the real thing down to the last acanth acanthus leaf uh, so make it absolutely correct and it became famous it also took talk about expenses it took uh, 125 men only men i guess carpenters and every other kind of uh, worker to build this over about four months and the set alone cost a hundred thousand dollars wow which was, which was multiple millions in those days by far the single biggest item except for cash costs he yeah. made really good use of it didn't he and i really like how um when mr smith first comes into the senate his first day where he's going to be sworn in there's that lovely the up little page yes with him he doesn't walk him around but he points out mr smith saying what's that over there and who was sitting there and, and the page, this little page, as remember you said, the page is a little younger than a page would normally be, but this little boy is so well informed about the workings of the Senate. So Capra gets to pan around on his set and show all the parts of it, almost to say, yeah, you, this is the Senate chamber. And well, there's no false wall here. Yeah. All four walls are the Senate chamber. And he's very correct in, in the kid at the page little guy named Robert Jones, he's very correct in pointing out the right sections too. Because this is such a perfect imitation, he can spot the uh, sections of the uh, of the chamber very precisely and tell exactly who can sit there. Right. So it's exact in that respect too. I, I, I love the fact that, and I always highlight in this in my talks with uh, this movie, is how this set, this replica, became a perfect model for the Senate where at a time when most people had never been to Washington and didn't come here on school trips or spring break or travel here for any kind of tourist stuff. Very rarely. People didn't have cars. People didn't fly. Uh, this was, to all intents and purposes for the American public, an introduction to their legislature, uh, which I find very gratifying. It was, it, yeah. and that's why, the, and the film was a big hit. So, millions of people got their first look of the chamber through a fake, but an exquisite fake. Maybe the best set ever made in Hollywood. What happens to the set after Mr. Smith goes to Washington? It was broken up and put in, uh, uh, stacked in racks and big uh, uh, warehouses, and has been brought out several times for other films. Uh, because the replica is a replica, it's still the same size, it hasn't changed. More, maybe most prominently, uh, the film that used it was another Senate-driven uh, movie called uh, Advise and Consent. Ah, yes, which we'll be talking about, yeah, in... Okay, in 1962. Yeah. Uh, and very much a Washington film, but very much about senators. Uh, and that was used, uh, all the dimensions were there, they had to do a lot of touch-up, uh, and they had to, they it, when you see the Biden consent with coming up you'll see that the um, there's different paintings they've got different uh, fabrics on the wall they kept most if not all of the desks by the way all those wooden desks one per senator 96 in this case uh, were handmade every uh, they're handmade replicas of what the real desks look like good walnut wood carpenter yeah really master carpenters produced all of them a couple and, of them are still around right you said didn't at least one of them is here in dc it's at the u.s capitol historical society yeah but i don't think they have it out they should they have in any it. case this is a, a, a masterpiece of of uh, what filmmaking can do yeah it sounds like to me um that 
Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Frank Capra, in your criteria, they got DC right. This is not a film where people, you're gonna roll your eyes and say, oh, they could have done so much better in depicting um, the goings on at the US Capitol and Congress and our city. Yeah. I'm sensing that this is a film where there's a lot of success in conveying Washington, DC. Do you think that? Yes, although uh, in my book I highlight a few goofs, but they're not necessarily they? <laughs> they're not, they're not necessarily structural. Well, uh, one is uh, procedural, and this happens when uh, at the beginning when Mr. Smith comes in to get sworn in as a, as a new senator, and uh, there are although it's an it's an opening of a session it, it implies so it would be fairly full of people, but it probably has more people sitting in the Senate for the for the noon session than would or normally be the case. But more egregious, and this has been the case ever since we had a Senate, when the, um, uh, this, the, the, sen the president of the Senate, he's called by the way, which is of course the vice president. Yeah. Correct? Constitutionally. But he's never called the vice president. He's called the president of the Senate. And every time we see the floor or the dais, the same guy, Harry Carey is in, right. is in the seat. It never, just, it never changes. That would never happen, ever. Uh, it's done for dramatic effect and for the script. It's not, nothing's wrong physically, but the idea of the same man presiding over the Senate every day, every whatever, every session is, would never happen, it just never has. In fact, the, of course, the vice president who has an office there and I think typically only comes in to break tie votes uh, is, or so, make special pronouncements. Uh, he just isn't there. Instead, they have a, a rotating group of senators, usually junior senators who take the chair. You know, That's one thing I noticed, or someone who's not there, um, it's a little hard to tell because you, the, the film doesn't, there's not a moment when, they, when it pans the entire, all the sitting senators, but I happen to know in 1939, and is, is the film set in 1939 or is it earlier? No, it's contemporary. Okay, yeah, so there's, there are quite a few women who you see in the Senate chamber um, observing uh, their staffers, mm -hmm. but there is not a female senator, except there was in 1939. There was a, um, a female senator named Hattie Carraway, who represented Arkansas. Um, so he could have maybe had a woman <laughs> in there, but it doesn't appear to me from looking at the film that he did include her. Yeah, and what's interesting is that she gets her, originally she got her Senate seat the same way Mr. Smith does, that her, in her in case of her, her husband passed away, he was the Senator, and then yep. he took over, finished his term, and then she ran for election on her own Accord and she was elected with mm -hmm. help from Huey Long of all people. That's a that's a good Washington walks note. Yes, and that's from a Washington walks tour. That's why I oh, there you go. Um, uh, let me just mention two other little goofs. They're not bad, but they're 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 there. Uh, one is the he, at the Union Station uh, scene, where by the way, uh, wasn't shot at. You know, it was all uh, in invented. The Union Station scenes were not shot in Union Station, they just had Union Station uh, st stuff in the backdrop. When he discovers the, uh, that he's, he gets a gog looking at the Capitol from the station, he said, look, look, and there's the, the white dome of the Capitol. It's, it's askew, that's not a view, the, the, the doors are all wrong, they're at Hollywood, they're not, it's not the doors of, the double doors of the station. And you can't see that angle uh, by the, by the Columbus Fountain to the, to the Capitol. It just doesn't exist. So it's in another oddball thing like that, so they have to do all the time is do a pace job. He's in his office with um, uh, Gene Arthur, and he's it, he's looking dramatically at the Capitol Dome again right. and right. Uh, exalting American democracy. That dome out there is pointing, pointing, and it's all lit. Look at that dome, etc. Uh, it's an angle that's impossible. <laughs> because it, it's basically, it, he's not even on the Senate side, he's on the House side. And he's, he's right. about three, three blocks down the mall, just by <laughs> geography. So, you know, small stuff.
Right. Only, only I would notice. So you you figure that out by watching the film that you got oh, yeah. curious about by looking by looking at a still. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my job. <laughs> well, here's probably one of the most famous stills from this film. What's what's happening here to Senator Jefferson Smith? Poor guy. He's just uh, he's come up against the um, the bosses and uh, the syndicate in his state who controls all the politicians, including the senator. At the left there, um, Claude Rains playing uh, Senator Payne, his, his kind of mentor who basically he turns on. This is at the very end where there's a, he wants to uh, challenge the, uh, the bad guys with a, a, a different kind of a bill, which he's, by the way, defending here. He's in the middle of a filibuster. And Payne is trying to get any way uh, to get rid of him. And Edward Arnold, the bad guy back home, has sent or told his, his mugs to inundate the Senate with uh, denunciations of uh, Jefferson Smith. And so tens of thousands of telegrams and letters come pouring in denouncing his, uh, his dam project, which he wants to do for his boy rangers. And so it's right up to the end here, and uh, uh, Payne is wincing. He doesn't quite know what's going to happen. But Smith, literally, uh, after making one more appeal, he collapses from from 23 hours of uh, filibuster yeah. having gone nowhere. Uh, it's a very dramatic finish. And he, he literally collapses among the, uh, right here, right after this shot, he collapses against all the letters and pain runs out. He can't take it any longer. This kid who, he, who he's friends with his father and he admires him, pain runs out when you don't know what's gonna happen. And other people run to help see if Smith's okay. And you hear, gunshots from outside and Payne comes running back in with a gun, having tried to kill himself and ex exulting saying, he didn't do it, it's all my fault. He, the boy's innocent, he, he's right. And conf confesses in effect on the floor, end of film. And can I mention something interesting about the end of film? Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't the original ending. Uh, Capra wrote uh, several more scenes after the dramatic finale in the, on the Senate floor, um, with Smith and uh, Saunders, the, the Gene Arthur character, triumphantly going back to his hometown, Jackson City, again, the, the, the state is the name, some in the West. And it, there were several scenes of a triumphant Smith and his now wife, I think, or girlfriend, whatever, coming into town on a train, like a ticker taped train and going on a parade down the main street. Uh, and they, while they're going down in the parade on the street, he sees uh, Senator Payne on the sidewalk. And uh, they, they've re reconciled. And now oh. everything's going to be OK. So it's a super happy ending right. uh, with them triumphant and, and uh, ticker tape flying in their face. Uh, all of this was cut. The, uh, it, wasn't, it was a happy ending, but it was much more dramatic in the final version, which uh, uh, Capra, Capra figured out. And, and the, because the film was so long, almost three hours, in that version, he, he knew there was something wrong with the rhythm. And he, before release and before final uh, print, he had several screenings uh, of people in, in California to see what they thought. And basically, the consensus from those viewers was, uh, or previewers, was they didn't need that. That mm. stuff at the end. It was already clear. And of course, they made the right decision because it's dramatically effective. Right. Was, how was the film critically received when it was released? Extremely positively. It, was one of, it's a, it wasn't that rare a case because Capra films were basically all favored. They were, and they were all critically claimed. I mentioned his award nominations for almost six years in a row. Yeah. And, so which were, what were some of his award, other films he did? get nominated for or receive awards for? Yeah, in the, in the 30s alone, he won Academy Awards for, um, it happened one night, Clark mm -hmm. Gable and Claude Colbert. He won for Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur. And he won for You Can't Take It With You. With oh, Gene yeah. Arthur and uh, um, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And that was 1938. And then 39 was um, Mr. Smith, which was nominated for Best Picture, but did not win, in fact. It, was, it had 11 nominations for Academy Awards in 1939, the 1939 year, and it won one. 
best yeah, original story best original story from the novel i mean the, the novelist rewrote what best the, it? pardon me what best what one best picture that year yes because it had 11 nominations too right what uh okay 19, going, going, going with the wind oh right it had no chance <laughs> yeah so very honored and a, a blockbuster big right. money for columbia right Capra was already riding high he, he did a lot of got a, a nice contract for all of his movies but this really sealed the deal he was uh he was deemed a master what's your favorite washington moment or aspect of this film my favorite mm -hmm. gosh i i really love him coming into the chamber because it says so much about what the film was trying to do and it's it's so super patriotic but it isn't corny mm -hmm. uh, much many critics didn't like capra they thought he was too sentimental and uh the, the nasty ones used a joke about him called capra corn because he was so corny uh, but they work and and by the way there's this they're not only um sentimental and a little gooey sometimes but they can be very cynical uh that that's much of his humor is sardonic in yeah. this film, of course, it's journalists and Pauls who are all pigs or yeah. dumb. Well, Jean Arthur's character sort of starts out as, as kind of um, oh, she's a yeah, she's a and oh, uh, yeah. she wants to get yeah, out. Knowing she's had enough, and then turns around because yeah. she can't can't uh, withstand his his sincerity. Right, right. What else should we know about this film? Um, that oh God. obvious to us if we just viewed yeah. it. Well, it's, 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 one of the, it's one of the great Washington films, no question about it. It's in my top 10 anyway. Uh, and it's also, another thing is that historically it's been, it's been iconic in the sense that um, it was popular when it came out. It never stopped being popular. It was re re reissued many times, made a lot of money, uh, and political movies typically don't. And it's hung on as an icon. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if most Americans who go to movies at all think about a political film that they remember or have heard of, uh, most would probably say Mr. Smith. It's, and this is what, six, 80 years ago? It's amazing. Right. Well, Turn we have time. some questions. Please. Uh, and folks, I'm very sorry, those of you who, um, <laughs> weren't able to see the video. Apologies. We'll, we'll work on that for um, other times. But any questions that you have um, from Mike about this or um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington or about his book, in fact, I'm going to um, put up information about Mike's book. Um, if you want to get it, you can get it easily from Amazon, um, or you can get it from Mike directly, and he will sign it for you and mail it for you, and his contact information is there. Someone wants to know, was there ever a remake of this film? Uh, yes. Uh, there, there have been some really bad television versions, but in film, which is what I'm talking about, is movies, not, uh, not television. Uh, there was a uh, really bad, well, both, both remakes that I know of uh, were terrible. One was a film from 1976, uh, which was um, uh, blanking on the name of the writer-director. This was a, a Tom, he was a quirky director. He and his wife made uh, films in the 70s starring, oh, I'm just I'm missing on the lead. He played an American Indian figure who was a, uh, uh, lived in the West, Arizona, whatever, and was soft-spoken, but uh, deadly with his, uh, he was a karate guy, whatever, and uh, martial, martial arts moves. Um, I'm blanking on his title, I just have to. Yeah, you know, I don't do that either. No, it, but, no but he had a, he had a couple of big hits, and then he wanted to remake Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and which he called Mr. <laughs> whatever his, his name in the film was, and I'm just, I'm blanking on it. Hmm. Uh, and he did come to Washington and got some permits and then uh, made a mess of things uh, and was finally basically kicked out of Washington. 
Oh my god! He couldn't finish. He did. He did some location shooting here, right on the, on the uh, around the residence of the, on the uh, green sward of the Capitol. Uh, so we got good access, but it actually soured the uh, sergeant at arms uh, at the Capitol. So oh, his his that, crew made so uh, much of a mess, and and tromped down stuff and broke tree uh, bushes and branches. He, he just made an ass of himself. And uh, and then protested to the to uh, the media that he'd been uh, blackballed and kicked out. The film is extremely hard to find. Hmm. Uh, it was buried by the studio, which was independent. It didn't have a major distributor. He did finish it, uh, but he didn't. Uh, it was a mess. The conflict here from the uh, the bad guys in this case were not so much from his hometown as they were from. Uh, Washington, the lobbyists for anti-environmental stuff, right, uh, right? The gas companies and so on. So the villain was uh, uh, the energy business, and he was the uh, sweetheart who was going to make all these people in, be environmentally competent. This is 1976. Yeah, this, I just can't remember the guy's name, but it'll come to me sometime. It will, like at 12, 3 in the morning tonight. Someone no, wants no, to know no. why, why only 96 seats in the Senate in this film? Pardon me? Oh, how come there are only 96 seats in the Senate? Because we didn't have Alaska and Hawaii. Right, right. Oh, by the way, another, another really silly, it's mildly amusing, but it's more contemporary. In 2002, Reese Witherspoon, who was hot, at the, really hot at the time, the actress, and she had made two years before. Um, oh God, I'm having trouble with names. Legally here. blonde. Legally blonde. Huh? Legally, Legally blonde. blonde. <laughs> Precisely. Legally blonde. Good. And she got another uh, contract from her studio to make another um, Legally Blonde movie. And she settled on Washington as the source. And she basically copied the story of uh, Mr. Smith with a new with a rewrite, and where she ended up being a staffer in the house to. Uh, a representative played by uh, right. uh, Sigourney Weaver, I think. No, 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 no. it's uh, Sally Fields. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, oh, that's right. she comes, comes from Massachusetts, comes to work in Washington, and her, her uh, aim is to get uh, legislation through her congresswoman to uh, pass the Buster Bill, Buster right. being her dog. Her chihuahua. And, uh, <laughs> her chihuahua, and, and not to have, uh, the idea was to have no. Uh, experimentation on animals, right, right, right. Uh, and exemplified by her wonderful Buster, who's a poodle, right. And she's in pink all the time, and well, she has her buddies. I think his uh, name is Brewster, Brewster, little Brewster, her Chihuahua. Did I think you're right. Stewart, did Jimmy Stewart that's ever write? That's did, why it's the Brewster Bill. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Did uh, case, Jimmy Stewart ever write a memoir or talk about his memories of doing Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? He, he did, but I haven't read it, so I, I can't tell you. I read Capra about his making of the film, but, uh, in which was, he talked about Ampli, he had a good time. Um, one, one good story about uh, the uh, opening of this film, which was, which was unique in uh, DC history, uh, the film was much anticipated. People were all excited about it, especially people on the Hill. And so Cap Capra agreed, and the studio agreed, to have the world premiere at the DAR, uh, auditorium in DC, Constitution Hall. And so on October 1939, the, all the best folks and all most of the senators and congressmen and uh, a whole lot of other invitees, a special screening, the, the world premiere of Mr. Smith and Kappa was there uh, with many, many other swells. And after the film was over, in fact, during some, quite a few senators left because they, they look, said they looked so bad. And a couple of people, including um, Joseph Kennedy, by then at the time ambassador to, to the UK, said uh, this movie should be banned from overseas uh, showings because it sets such a bad said such a bad light on, on the US. And at the end of the film, many other people went out in a huff, including a major senator who was sitting next to uh, Capra and went out in a huff. Uh, and there's a, uh, a final little to the critical uh, uh, reaction was great, but not political, not 
hmm. politics, uh, not hmm. political reaction, because that was bad for the country. Oh, another thing was um, an, uh, another group of studios, major studios, had heard so much bad stuff about this film. It was so damaging to our reputation that a, co uh, a coalition of studios agreed to pay $2 million to pull it from release, to bury it. And Columbia stuck wow. to its guns and kept it going. And it was not only a hit in the US, but elsewhere in the uh, overseas until World War II happened. Um, and the final thing I wanted to mention, and I have to read this, uh, Harry Truman was a senator from Missouri at the time. And he went to the, to the uh, screening and uh, he wrote later to his uh, wife, uh, Bess, in, back in, in, Louisiana, in uh, Missouri, and he said, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, this was a, Truman notes that he went to the DAR to see the film, along with many cabinet members and others and advisors, and a lot of other senators, including him, 80 or so, I think. His own review, however, was uh, crisp. Quote, it makes asses out of all the senators who are not crooks, but, it's all, but it also shows up the correspondence in their true drunken light. So a pox, <laughs> a pox on both their houses. Right, 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 right. You're gonna be happy, Mike. Someone who's listening in knows the film from 1977 that you reference, it's Billy Jack Goes to Washington. Thank you, whoever that nice person is. Laughlin. Someone, yes, Tom. Yeah. So Thanks so much. Someone just, is um, inquiring about that. The Mr. Smith is set, 1939. War is about to or has broken out in Europe. Not right. here yet, but there isn't any reference to well, there's one reference to sort of um, the countries at a hard time. I remember that, but there's no overt right. reference to World War II. It's it, no right. There's still a depression, and uh, one little hint of that is a reference that people have forgotten about altogether. At one point, somebody's uh, talking about contributing to the milk fund. Yeah, that's right. Which was for poor people at the time, and was and that people were, there was still in a plenty of poverty leading up to the beginning of uh, the war. No, but there's no overt, overt uh, other mention. There's no talk about overseas stuff. It's totally domestic. You know, it's speaking, it's speaking of 1939, that is a big year, actually, for classic American movies, isn't it? Because it's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. It's Gone with the Wind. It's also The Wizard of Oz, isn't it? Yep, Stagecoach. Stagecoach. It so, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a subject I've written about myself. I, I wrote a long essay about... Uh, Hollywood's Greatest Year, which is 1939. I think most writers agree. And I cite two, three dozen movies that were significant in that year, including the, the most famous ones. Um, in Hollywood on the Potomac, your book, it covers what time span? It starts with Mr. Smith, which seems appropriate because it's really the first significant Washington movie. And I'll underline that with it. It had uh, on location shooting of, uh, of significance for the first time ever. There'd been other Washington movies and movies with politicians and presidents, uh, not many, but a few, including in the silent era. But the first movie to actually depict Washington in a serious way, even if it was modest, uh, but with that great Senate set, was Mr. Smith. It starts with that. And it ends with when I stopped writing, when I, I, had, I was commissioned to do the book, and I finished at the end of 2011, and my last film was uh, J. Edgar by Clint Eastwood. How did you get commissioned to write Hollywood on the Potomac? Well, I had been, I'm, in my retirement, I'd been writing a, a local column about movies. Uh, I highlighted movies that were about Washington or had Washington elements because I enjoyed it. I lived here. They were more interesting to me. I started doing a series of lectures in my, in my hometown, I mean, in my area, Capitol Hill, at the local library. Uh, they were small basement showings of, of uh, screenings of film on video. And the people who let me do this, the local library, had a group of local citizens who have a support uh, operation called FOSSEL, pardon the expression, F-O-S-E-L. It's actually headed by people over 65 like me. But uh, they said, 
uh, we like the idea of your doing these um, these talks, and I wrote notes for each one, um, which later became chapters. And they said, would you ever thought about doing a book? And I said, of course. I've got half of it written in my head because I've been writing about this stuff all the time. And so they gave me big bucks to make sure we get a, get a printer. And uh, they paid for a um, designer, designer um, uh, set, setter. Uh, I did the, most of the photographic stuff. Uh, I acquired that myself. And I got a big help from the main DC library because they underwrote me by agreeing to buy 250 copies off the top. Wow. So that was a good, a, a great opener to be yeah. able to finance it. It doesn't cost, it didn't cost much money. Um, it's made its money back many, several times since, but uh, it's did okay. I'm still got copies, so I'm still trying to peddle them. Yeah. Mr. Smith is in your top 10 list, you said. Um, sure. What can, would you be willing to share your top 10 list with us? Sure, I'll give it to you right off the bat. I'll give you two of them. These are in uh, chronological order. Mr. Smith starts off, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, born, born Yesterday from 1950. It was a wonderful uh, comedy. Well, it was a big hit on Broadway and starred uh, Judy Holliday, made her a star. Uh, and it's very much a Washington picture. It has a lot of Washington uh, location stuff. The Day the Earth Stood Still, an early science fiction film, which takes place in DC. And we're gonna talk about that next Wednesday. Oh, great, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Day the Earth Stood Still. I'm sorry, I, was, I was Seven Days in May, uh, a real tough thriller, um, political thriller with Frederick March, Burt Lancaster, and Kirk Douglas. And Burt Lancaster is a rogue general who's trying to take over the government, st staging a, a coup. All the President's Men, 1976, not to be forgotten, and probably the best Washington movie ever made. Uh, not because of politics, but because of journalism. Being There, a great comedy, one of Peter Sellers' last films. Broadcast News, another terrific uh, DC comedy, shot entirely in Washington, completely. Uh, one reason I like it so much. A Few Good Men, a uh, courtroom drama with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. In the Line of Fire, a really good thriller, Clint Eastwood running around, running after a bad guy who's trying to assassinate the president. Slam, a very little known but wonderful, totally locally produced film made by a documentarian about a guy who's a, uh, a rapper, talker, a poet, uh, in his travails, getting out of, out of the DC jail. And uh, then I like uh, State of Play, which is a Russell Crowe, Helen Mirren picture. Uh -huh. Also journalistic. Journalists, yeah. Here's one uh, final question. And then the, this okay, is then a fun, this is ten that I love. Um, oh shoot, where'd it go? Hold on. Somebody it has a favorite the reaction. There's a reference to um, Eleanor Roosevelt or Franklin Roosevelt in the film. Um, maybe someone makes a little crack about them. And this person was wondering what um, the reaction might have been from the Roosevelt administration to the film. The Roosevelt administration, boy. Yeah, let's see here, I just found the question, sorry. Um, this person wrote, I enjoyed the handoff reference to Eleanor Roosevelt, joke that after Senator Payne becomes president, First Lady Miss Payne might write a column called My Day. So okay. any information about how FDR and Eleanor might have received the film? I really don't know. A, a, a biography of, uh, of the uh, Roosevelt's may show something, which, uh, but I'm not aware of it. I haven't lo ever looked for it for myself. It doesn't mean there isn't something. Right. There's somebody telling like a, a, a biography about what the, they were up to, because he was, he was a full, command of his, uh, of his office at the time. Right, right. He was getting ready to run. If folks are, if you all are interested in watching Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, you can rent it to view on um, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, I believe. And there's one other online um, source, which I'm blanking on what it is, but it's readily available for, um, people to look at if they want to. 
And mm -hmm. let me just show you what we've got. If I can find it. Coming up next week. No, I don't have that in front of me right now. Sorry. <laughs> but next week, um, Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about with Mike, the day the earth stood still. And then next Wednesday at 1230, we're going to be talking with one of our Washington Walks guides, who is a former ambassador. His name's Mark Bellamy, and he's going to be talking about um, a terrorist attack on a foreign diplomat that occurred right on Embassy Row in DC. And he's going to talk about what security measures are taken to protect diplomats, what it's like to be a diplomat, knowing that you're on the Al Qaeda hit list. Um, so that should be a really interesting and rich conversation. Mike, okay. thank you so much. For you any, last, any last questions or are we cool? I think we're good. We've kind okay. of hit our hour, but we'll save more for next week. And at one of these sessions, I can't wait to hear what you think is the movie with the most egregious failed depiction of Washington, D.C., but we'll save that. For I've, got a couple of, I've got a couple of candidates. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, thanks everyone very much for joining us. Um, yes. Happy movie, movie viewing between now and next week. And we'll hope to see all of you next week. Wish I could have seen, I I could have seen you. It would have been great. Yeah. Good night. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Mike. Ciao.